her body right now. And Father, we know that in your presence that there is joy. And I just pray that as we worship, you would take any heaviness and that you would replace it with your joy. Tonight, may we just know that wherever your presence is, are all of these wonderful things that you are. May we just get in close tonight and experience everything you have for us. I pray that you would anoint Mike when he comes to serve and speak, and I pray that you would anoint this worship team as they serve and sing and lead in worship. Just be with us in this moment, we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's let's worship. How's everybody doing? Hey, just so you know, this is not a show. Get up. You are actively participating in this, okay? So join with us. Uh, hopefully the words are going to be up there. If they're not, these are probably songs that you've heard. We're going to share th- uh, with you. But again, it's not about us. This is all about our Heavenly Father. Lord, we come to you. We want this to be all about you, Father. Everything that we say, everything that we do, we want it to come into full and complete line with what you have planned for us, Lord Jesus. Be glorified in this time. In your name we pray. Amen. Blessed be your name in the good and the bad. Father, we give it all to you. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, with streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Hallelujah. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place. Though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Every blessing, every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. Closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name. When the sun's shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. On the road marked with suffering, though there's pain in the offering, blessed be your name. Every blessing. Every blessing you pour out, I turn back to praise. And when the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. He gives and takes away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. 
Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. He gives and takes away. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, the blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Lift him up, church. Lift him up. Oh, Father, in the good and the bad, blessed be your name. Hallelujah. We love you, Jesus. You are worthy of every single thing that we can say, Father. Every good and perfect thing comes from you. We thank you for that, Jesus. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days, I've been held in your hand. Moment that I wake up, till I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life, you have been. Faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will see of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fires in darkest night. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. And I've known you as a friend. And I have lived in the goodness of God. Yes, I have. And all my life you have been faithful. Yes. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am faithful, oh, I will sing of the goodness. Oh God, but your goodness is running after, keeps running after me. Thank you, Jesus. Your goodness is running after, keeps running after me. With my life laid down and surrendered now, I give you everything. Cause your goodness is running after, keeps running after me. Your goodness is running after, keeps running after me. Cause your goodness is running after, keeps running after me. With my life laid down and surrendered now, I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, 
amazing we just get to come right before you there's no barriers come right to your feet Lord Jesus we can give it all to you you hide nothing from us Lord yes we just be glorified in everything that's said and done tonight Lord Jesus we love you bless this time bless these individuals that are here bless those that couldn't be able to be here Lord bless those that need a special healing touch we love you, Jesus. We love you, God. God bless you. Amen. God's good, is he not? Thank you, team, for leading us to the throne. Amen. Amen. Well, tonight you may be seated. Uh, tonight you may be seated. <laughs> this morning, not this afternoon. How to mash up two sentences. Nobody does it better than I do. Hey, tonight uh, we have the privilege of, of listening to one of my heroes of the faith. When I, and I, I don't say that lightly because Mike and Cindy, when they were on the mission field to China, the very first time I heard them, and I don't remember how many years ago, but probably 20, somewhere in that ballpark, but I remember just thinking, these are the real deal. And if you knew them and know that, the, the real deal. And when the opportunity for and they were talking about coming to Macomb, there was nobody more excited that one of my heroes of the faith was going to be living 12 miles from my house and getting to rub shoulders with him. And so what a privilege to be able to uh, offer up the, the pulpit and say, hey, come share with pastors. As a pastor... Uh, never not being a missionary, but can we just give a warm welcome to Pastor Mike? Thanks. 
All right, John, thank you. And we, we felt the same when we met you, bro. That's exactly um, how we felt, too. It's been a long time, and it's been a good time. Uh, it's my honor to be here. Wow, I'm kind of, is that, is that ready, Matt? I can't tell. Okay, there we go. All right, there's my, uh, there's my title for tonight. I'm just seeing uh, nobody's heading for the exits. I, I will explain what that title means in just a minute. Um, but I, I do appreciate this opportunity. I love um, this section. We have really, we have enjoyed in the last two months since we've been here, we have enjoyed this is our third or fourth meeting. We came to one before we even came, and then uh, November, yeah, this is, this is our fourth meeting. And this is, this is a blessing to know you, to call you friends, uh, to call you co-workers. Uh, I really don't know. I've been pastoring for two months now. So I really don't know what I'm doing up here. I feel like my pastoral knowledge is like a thimble or something, you know. And I'm, I'm in the midst of 55-gallon barrels. I mean, that's, that's, that's really how I feel. Um, so I don't, I guess I'm, what I'm saying is I'm sharing tonight just some things that, that I have learned. If there's, I think the reason John asked me, I'm pretty sure, if you know John Keck, everything's about missions, and he specifically wanted me to talk about missions tonight. And so I'm going to help him do that. I'm gonna, that's part of what I'm going to do. That, I'm sure that's why he asked me, and so that's going to be part of what I'm going to do tonight. But the other than that, um, I thought, if just praying about it, if there's anything I can do, maybe I can give a fresh perspective to pastoring since it's brand new to me. I've never done this before, you know. Uh, and so that's really what I want to do. And so I want to share uh, that God is an amateur. Uh, God is an amateur. Now, um, to talk about that, really, we're, I'm going back to the original meaning in English of the word amateur. It's actually from a Latin word called amour. And if you speak Spanish... The word amor means what? Love, right. It means love. And that's what the original word meant is in, in Latin. The, when it came into English, the original word meant someone who did something purely because they love doing it. And so today, when we, when we think of the word amateur, we compare it to and, and contrast it with a professional. In other words, today, the word amateur means something about skill and talent and ability. But in the original English word, when the word first came into English, it didn't have anything to do with those. It had to do with the motive behind why people do what they do. And so the opposite of amateur 300 years ago was slave, not professional. And so with that definition of it, God is the ultimate amateur. He has never done anything without the motive of love. It's hard for us to understand that because we, with sin, always have some kind of mixed motive. We never do anything purely for pure motives, and even when we do something out of love, there's always just that little piece of it that sin is involved, and we're, we're not quite doing it all out of love. But God is purely, and purely, purely, purely an amateur in the original meaning of the word. So I want to look at Ephesians 2 tonight, if you have your Bibles or your phones. <laughs> Excuse me, if you have your phones, <laughs> please click to <laughs> uh, Ephesians 2.18. And I'm going to start, we're going to start reading just a few verses just to set the context. Uh, Ephesians 2.18, we're going to start in Ephesians 2.14. And it starts like this. I'm reading from the ESV tonight. For he himself is our peace talking about Jesus, for he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two and making peace, verse 16, and might reconcile us both 
to God. If I can find my place here. Oh, there it is. In one body through the cross, whereby killing the hostility. Now, here is verse Verse 18 is where I want to be. Uh, no, 17. And he came and preached peace to you. Now, remember this verse. This is verse 17. This is going to be part of our context. And he came and preached peace to you who are far off and peace to those who were near. And here's our verse for tonight. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Lord, help us tonight, I pray. I thank you that your word is anointed, and I ask you tonight in Jesus' name to anoint my lips tonight to present faithfully the word of God. Lord, I ask you to anoint the ears and the hearts and the minds to receive tonight. And Lord, I pray that the things that we talk about tonight, the things that we, that we learn together, Lord, will be beneficial for everyone that's here, Father. We give you praise. We give you glory. We honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So let's look at verse 18. This is one of my favorite verses. It has been for a long, long time. We're going to look at the three prepositions in this, in this verse. The first one is to, the second one is through, and the third one is in. To, through, and in. And we're going to look at to whom? Well, it, if you look at it, it's to who? I'm asking who. who? Who? What's it say? Who? To the Father. Good. Through the Son, through Jesus, through him it says, but in context it's Jesus, and in the Spirit. I love this verse because when I was in Bible school studying this verse, this is one of the few New Testament verses where very concisely in one verse we have the entire Trinity represented. It doesn't happen that often. There's kind of some vague references. We can see it in there with like maybe 18 or 20 different verses. But there's only two or three where expressly it's, it's, we can see the Trinity in that. So I've always loved this. And so what we're going to look at tonight is to the Father. To the Father. So if you look at verse 17, it says that, that those who were far off Talking to the Ephesians, those who were far off and those who were near have been brought together. Now, what is Paul talking about? Who are those who were far off? Okay, right, the, the, the Gentiles. He's talking about Gentiles. And who are those who have been brought, who were, who were near? Who's that? The Jews, exactly right. So in this context, what Paul is talking about is bringing together the Gentiles and the Jews. And so when we talk about to the Father, we are talking about people groups, people groups, Gentiles, Jews, all the people groups being brought together to, to the loving Heavenly Father. So that's when we're going to talk, John, about missions. To the Father. Through Jesus, what I want to share there is how do we present the gospel of Jesus to a culture that has departed from the Christian faith? How do we share Jesus today in a secular America? What do we need to do? And the third one is, in the spirit, what do we as ministers, what do we as pastors need in our lives to keep us in tune with Jesus? Is that okay? Well, if it's not, it's too late, so, all right. To the Father, through Jesus, in the Spirit. All right, so let's look, first of all, at to the Father. And again, this is talking about missions, talking about reconciling people groups, Gentiles and Jews, together, reconciling them to the Father. One of the consequences of information overload that we have today, we have so much information coming at us, one of the consequences is that nothing really moves us very much anymore. Here's some headlines just from the last 10 days, and I could have pulled up 20 more. But here's 22 dead in, in Pakistan, 19 killed in Bronx. That actually was downgraded to 17 that were actually killed, but you get the idea. 6,000 have been detained in Kazakhstan. Can you imagine what those 6,000 that were arrested are going through right now? 
But see, these things don't move us anymore because we hear this every day. We hear this every hour, over and over and over again. A hundred people died. We just had a big vo underground volcano with a tsunami. And these things don't move us anymore because we hear it so much. It's called, there's actually a name for it. It's actually called compassion fatigue. There's actually a name a psychologist have for it. It's compassion fatigue. There is so much heartache, so much pain, and because we have so much news coming at it, we had us, we hear it all the time, and so we get fatigued hearing it, and it doesn't move us anymore. One of my favorite writers is Leonard Ravenhill. Anybody know Leonard Ravenhill? Okay. One of my favorite poems goes like this. Could a mariner sit idle if he heard the drowning cry? Could a doctor sit in comfort and just let his patients die? Could a fireman sit idle, let men burn, and give no hand? Can you sit at ease in Zion with the world around you damned? We have to let the compassion of a loving heavenly God that loves everyone, that loves people groups, we have to let that penetrate the wall that we have to build up because we have all this information, all this stuff coming at us, we have to let the love of the Father penetrate our hearts, that we are moved with compassion for the people in the towns where we live. Ver and live. Now, verse 18 says that the two groups have been reconciled to the Father, the two groups, and that's talking again about mission. So I just want to share for a couple of minutes uh, the state, what I call the state of the world in missions today. And to do this, I need three volunteers, all right? So you don't have to do anything except stand here and hold a card, all right? Who is my first volunteer? Jim, thank you very much. Stand right here, if you would, please. My second volunteer is there. And Salome, thank you, a third volunteer. Actually, Jim, would you come here? And then, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. DJ, DJ, okay, is there, and then Salome is right here. Thank you for volunteering, Salome. Salome was on our team in, in, in China for a, how long? Five years. I was going to say ten, but no, no. <laughs> and she's now waiting to get back. She's been in America for, for two years. So what we're going to do is we're going to divide the world, not by hemispheres, not by income, we're going to divide the world into three different groups based on how much they have a chance to hear about Jesus. Okay? So Jim is the reached world. Jim is the Christian world. Jim is all the nations of the world where people, if you're born in the, in the country, people say, yes, I'm a Christian because I was born in America or whatever country it is. Okay? These are, the, these are the Christian nations. DJ, he is the nations, he is the nations that have been reached with the gospel already. Everybody in DJ's countries, if they want a Bible, they can get a Bible, they can go, they can go purchase it. There's Christian radio, there's Christian television, there's Christian churches. These are the countries that have been reached with the gospel. Everybody in this country in these countries, has access to the gospel. But poor Salome. Salome is the unreached people. These are people that will be born, they will live their entire life, and they will die. And unless something changes, they will never once hear the gospel. There's no Bibles there. There's no churches there, there's no pastors there, there's no Christians there. There's no way for Salome and the people who live with Salome to be able to hear the gospel. So let's look at percentages. Jim represents 33% of the world. The reached nations are, DJ is 38%, and Salome is 29%. So it's not quite one-third, but if we took a few from here and put them here, then we'd be almost one-third, one-third, one-third. So it's somewhat of an even distribution of people, not, not, too, not too different. Now, let's take a vote real quick. 
Um, where do you think we should send missionaries? Should we send missionaries to the Christian nations or the rich nations or the unreached nations? So just point. Let's just vote right now. Where do you think we should? Okay, good. Yeah, all three of them are good. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. Okay. But most of you are pointing towards Salome. Okay. Well, let's see what we actually do in the United States. So these are missionaries that go to these different countries. Jim gets to receive 72% of the missionaries. Now, these are not pastors. These are people who are identified as missionaries, okay? These are missionaries. So 72% of the missionaries today go to Christian nations. Another 25% DJ gets. Uh, these are nations that are already reached, and they have 25% of the missionaries going to them. And Salome... She gets to receive 3% of the missionaries in our world today. Now, this is for North America, for all denominations, for all missions groups together. All right? So, the Assemblies of God is not very different than this, though. If you look at where the missionaries are going and who the missionaries are, this is pretty much the distribution of missionaries. I challenge you, if you go home tomorrow, go home to, well, go home tonight. If you go home tonight and look at your missions, missionaries that you support in your church, if you look at that tomorrow, I almost 100% guarantee you that this is what you're going to see. Unless you're strategic and planning and trying to do something more to unreach. Well, let's look at money then. If we're talking about missionaries that are going to serve, here's the money. So money to Christian nations is 87%. Money to reached nations is 12%. And missions giving to reach unreached people groups, to reach unreached people is 1%. All right, now what I'm not telling you is to drop these missionaries. <laughs> Please don't misunderstand me. Please don't misunderstand. I know, I know. <laughs> I'm sorry, Jim, you volunteered. I, uh, <laughs> but the point is, is that I think all of us have a sense that this is one place where we can place our priorities. And this is what we're talking about when we talk about issues. Give these guys a hand. That was awesome. <laughs> Amen. All right. So, John. <laughs> <laughs> I did what you told me to do. Now, let's go on. <laughs> so that is the Father, to the Father. We're talking about missions. We're talking about people groups being reconciled to the Father, to the Father. The second part, then, is through the Son, through Jesus. When we talk about through him, what I want to talk about tonight is how do we take the gospel of Jesus into a world that has turned against us. You know, I'm kind of bummed out because I've only been pastoring for two years. We left, we left 30 years ago to go to the mission field. When we left to go to the mission field, pastors were looked up to. Paps, pastors were revered. People said, oh, you're a pastor. Oh, that's really a good, a good thing. Then I come back and I get to be a pastor. And guess what? It's not a good thing anymore. Nobody likes us. We have to find a way to bring Jesus to our current world. Pastors today, and this is, I think, maybe again why John, why John asked me to come, is because pastors today, we have to act like missionaries. If there's anything, Cindy and I don't, really don't know why the Lord called us home back to America after 30 years in un reaching unreached people. We don't know what, what that was all about. We don't know yet. <laughs> part of it is, as we just feel in our heart, perhaps part of it could be that we need to help pastors understand a missionary mindset to reach a society that is now a different society than it was when most of us in this room were growing up. When most of us became pastors, the world is a different place today than it was then. And we have to become like missionaries in order to reach our world. The world around us and our communities no longer reflect biblical values. 
So we have to become missionaries. So what do missionaries do? Well, they learn the language. So Cindy and I got to learn Chinese, and then we got to learn Arabic. It was very, no, it wasn't very exciting. Anyway, yeah, okay. but the first thing we have to do is we have to learn the language. Then we have to learn the culture. We have to know how to relate to people in their culture. The third thing we have to do is we have to live like local people. When Todd and Arnetta and when Salome were with us in China, when we were all working together, the school gave us free housing because we were university teachers. But we chose, even though we could have lived for free on campus, we chose to pay rent and to live in the community so that our neighbors were the Chinese people all around us. We purposely chose to live in the community so that we could reach people for Jesus around where we were. So missionaries now learn to live locally. And the last thing is, is that they have to follow the local customs as close as they can if it doesn't violate the Bible. So when we were in Arabia, I could not take a second wife. Nor did I want to. <laughs> so, so as long as it doesn't conflict with the Bible, then we try to, as much as we can, act and eat and talk and, and recreate and do all the things like the people around us. Now, the American culture no longer reflects our Christian culture. It's no longer as easy to be a pastor. Maybe, you, maybe you, you already realize this. It's no longer as easy to be a pastor as it used to be. Has anybody noticed that? <laughs> Terry's kind of, <laughs> yeah. In fact, you know, it used to be, if we go back 20, 30 years ago, a pastor could stand in the pulpit and he could preach the truth of the Word of God. And that was enough. Because the society around knew enough about the Bible and knew enough about godliness and knew enough about Christian values that all it took to be a pastor was just to declare the truth from the Word of God. And that was enough because the culture was behind all of those different things that, that were happening. Today, that is not true. Today, we as pastors need to approach society and need to approach ministry just like, just like missionaries do. We have to, um, in, in the United States, we have to, this may look familiar, we have to learn the language. So what do the letters LGBTQIA stand for? How many of us know that? And if we don't know that, how can we witness to a homosexual when we get an encounter and want to share Jesus with the homosexual if we haven't taken the time to find out what's important to him and what he cares about, why should he even listen to us? We have to learn the language. We have to learn what they care about. We have to know what they do. We have to also learn the culture. We have to learn about what makes people the way they are in our society today. Where does the 30-year-old in the world today, where does he get his identity? We get our identity from Jesus <laughs> and, the, and the father that loves us and a, and a son that died for us. That's where our identity comes from. Well, where does he get his identity? The 30-year-old in society today gets his identity from himself. He has to be true to himself. That's really what matters to him. My needs, my wants, my desires, all of that is what the 30-year-old in society is looking at today. I have to be myself. That's the big important thing. What's the purpose of sex in our, in our society today? It's self-fulfillment. Live with one person for your whole life? Are you kidding me? How, how could that even be fun? I would be so unfulfilled. This is not me talking. Honey. This is <laughs> 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 
<laughs> we might need some counseling next week, Todd. <laughs> you, do you understand? That sex is just about me. That's why it doesn't matter if the person's a man or a woman. It doesn't matter any of that stuff. None of that matters as long as I get fulfilled, as long as I get what I need and what I desire. That's what they think of. That's our culture today. Where does happiness come from? Well, happiness comes from fulfilling my own desires, what the things I want. I must never sacrifice for someone else because that would be an inconvenience to me. So I have to do all those things. How are all of my problems solved? For us, we pray. We go to Jesus. <laughs> we try to we get our problems solved through prayer. But the guy out there, how does he get his, pro his problem solved? He turns to science. He turns to intellect. That's his salvation. That's what's going to save him. If he can learn enough, if he can get enough of science, that's what's going to save him. That is what the culture is like today. We have to live like the local peoples do. Local people do. We, we have to be comfortable sitting, talking to a guy, drinking a beer. I remember we first moved in. So we, we moved in two months ago, and, like, we were there only three or four days, and I looked across the street, and there was a house kitty corner from us. That we hadn't met the people yet. I saw there were four or five guys out in front of the house. So, so I said, oh, i got to go meet these guys. So I went, I went over there and began to talk with them, you know. And it turned out it, one of them was my neighbor. The other four or five guys were guys that worked with him. The Saturday afternoon, they were having a little get-together there. And so I stood around and talked to these guys. They had a beer in one hand and a cigarette in the other. And I sit and talk to them for 45 minutes. And I talk to them. I, I shared Jesus with them. I shared they knew I was a pastor. And, and I shared with them a little bit. But mostly, I talked about the things that are important to them. And I tried to relate to them. I tried to keep that door open so that I would have a chance to come back and talk to them again and again and again. And we have. My, he, my neighbor came over two or three days ago and helped me shovel my driveway. And we had a chance to talk again a little bit. And we brought them Christmas cookies, and they brought us Christmas cookies, and we, we're, we're interacting. But I know when I go to his house that it's not really going to be all that comfortable for me. <laughs> it's not going to be what I would want. But I want to be where the local people are. I want to invest my life in the neighborhood. I want them to be able to know that I'm real and that even though I love Jesus, I'm a, I'm a person, I accept them just the way they are right now, praying for them to come along to a different place. So we live local. And lastly, and of course, we have to follow the customs and the culture as long as they don't conflict with the Bible. So as you see, those four things are the same things that a missionary does. That's what I believe we need to do as pastors today. We have got to. So let me, let me just recap if I can some things that I have learned. Now, you guys I know are way ahead, because I haven't lived in this country for 30 years, so you guys already know all this stuff. You're already way ahead of me, okay? But let me just share the things that I have tried to learn and the things that I am trying to learn um, just, just for your remembrance, if you want to think of it that way. The frightening part of all this is, is that we live in a digital age, which means we have one hour of access to people a week and the digital world has access to them 167 hours every week. <laughs> every, hour, every, every other hour, it's 24-7, it's on. The world is dumping in their, in their mind and in their heart all the stuff from the world. We have one hour a week to try to counter that against 160. So that's, that to me is frightening. That to me, I want to just like destroy all the Wi-Fi. I don't think that'll work either. So, all right. So here's yeah, here's three truths from modern culture that that as I have studied and I've found, and you'll you'll know this. You're way ahead of me on this, but these are the three things that I have found that are the most important for me and my sharing with people. And the first one is this: there is no universal truth. The second one I call upon Oz Guinness. I don't know if you know Oz Guinness. If you don't, you need to. Uh, one of the great Christian thinkers of our era. 
You need to study and, and learn from Oz Guinness. He's going to share a little bit about social constructionism. And the third thing, which is so important, is I've already kind of alluded to it, is the, dom the uh, domination of science. Science is dominant over everything. So the first thing is there is the person out there, they do not believe in universal truth. Now, if someone tells you, there is no universal truth. You'll hear that if you witness to people. You'll get that right away. There is no universal truth. The first thing you have to know is, or the first thing you should say to them is, oh, wait, excuse me, is that a universal truth? See, the fact that they say there's no universal truth is what we call a self-defeating statement. <laughs> It by itself is a universal truth that they are saying there is no universal truth. So it's, it's, it's not logical, but they still believe it. They, don't, they do not believe in transcendent realities. We each create our own realities. Truth is personal. My truth may be different than your truth. And you can't push your truth on someone else because that's your truth, not their truth. So you can't push your truth on me. And so it's a shift from authority to what you, what you might say preference. It's a shift from authority to preference. Um, there's no longer the way, but there's only a way. Trying to figure out and trying to tell people about a universal truth in the culture that we live today is offensive. We have to know that. We have to know that it is offensive for us to share our universal truth. But the days are over when we can be unoffensive. When we, when we cannot, when we, when we can be unoffensive. If we are going to share truth, we are going to have to be offensive. We have universal truth to share. Here's an interesting story. I read this last week in, in New York Times. So I'll just tell you about the story. It's a guy uh, was just released from prison. He was a felon, and he stood in line for seven hours to vote in Texas. Well, in Texas, felons can't vote, okay? So he cast an illegal vote. So the New York Times wrote a story, and their outrage was not that a convicted felon cast an illegal vote, their outrage was that he waited in line for seven hours and then was arrested. <laughs> That's what infuriated the New York Times. He waited seven hours. So maybe we could change the headline. You know, man waits seven hours to rob a bank. Oh, that's, that's, that's outrage. Man waits seven hours to kidnap a six-year-old. Oh, that would... It doesn't make any sense, does it? But that's the society that we live in. That's what the values of our society is. There are no universal truths anymore. And so every person's truth is what they have for themselves. And so in this situation, what happens is emotions become truth. And anyone who can make the strongest emotions is the strongest person. And that's why there's so we hear so many stories about all the things that are happening because people are trying to stir up the most, the, the more you can stir up emotions, the more power you have. There is no universal truth. Well, the second one, is from, as I, as I said, from Oz Guinness. I'm not going to say anything. It kind of fits along with what we just said. Uh, but the first one is there's no given. So there's no special road. There's only a variety of paths that you can go down. There are no rules, again, because it's all preferences. And there are no limits. As long as you can do it, then it's okay. And there's nothing wrong with that. So get a chance, if you can, on YouTube. Oz Guinness has some of his ministry uh, on there. It's just fabulous. Third one is the domination of science. And I just want to share just for a second about the domination of science. The world of science uh, is, first of all, very empty. If you know anything about what scientists believe, it's this incredibly huge universe, and then every so many million light years away from each other, there's a little dot <laughs> in there. And so basically the universe, basically the world, basically everything we know is full of emptiness. 
The second thing about it, that it's blind and it's controlled by forces of nature, natural laws that we can never escape. And the world is cold and impersonal. The world doesn't care about you. The world doesn't care about me. The world is a cold and impersonal place. Well, the Bible world is very, very different. You see, the Bible world is not a place that's full of limited space. The Bible world is a place where there was beauty created for us to enjoy. And a loving Heavenly Father inhabits every nook and cranny of the farthest reaches of our universe and even beyond. So the world is not emptiness. The world is full of love. The world is, is full of the, the person of God. It's not controlled by inescapable laws of nature. It's controlled by the word of God. It's controlled by truth as laid out for us by a loving heavenly father. And for us, the supernatural world is more real than the real world. We have to keep reminding ourselves of that because our society is going to tell us science, the science world is the real world. Ours is imaginary. We have to keep before us at all times the world, the, the, the unseen world is the real world. <laughs> this is just passing away. Todd, even, even this part of the building <laughs> is passing away. Oh, is it going too? Is this part of? Oh, my. Okay. All right. Good. So it's all going. It's all going. <laughs> this, uh, and the last part then, it's not a cold world at all. It's not a cold world at all. It's a wonderful world that is dominated by a loving Heavenly Father who sent His Son to love us and to care for us. This is a picture of a scientist and an anthropologist named Tanya Luhrmann. And I was reading a book that she had written. She's an atheist. She's, a, she's an anthropologist. That was so heartbreaking. I read what she said. She said, it ought to be difficult to believe in God. She was looking at science, and she was talking about these different things. She said, it ought to be hard to believe in God. If you believe in science, it makes it very hard to believe in God. And then she said this, but if you could believe in God, why wouldn't you? And I, really, I, I mean, I'm a, it just, I began to weep when I read that. I thought, here is a heart of someone who has sold their life to science, and yet inside is that part that wants to believe in God. She wants to believe in God, but she's so bound by her culture. And so our job is to help people free, get free from that. If you could believe in God, why wouldn't you? And that's what I would say to her. <laughs> believe in God. Believe in God. So the domination of science. So these are, to me, the three important truths that I know I need to confront as I talk to people um, in, our, in our world today. So what do we do about these things? All right? What, what do we do? Well, these are, if I can, share five things that are important to me. Uh, you may have some different things. In fact, um, if you do have some things that I miss here, I would love to hear your ideas. So write me an email or call me on the phone and let me know because I really would like to know. But the first one is, number one, is that we need to learn everything we can about the modern culture. It's not a time to pull out of the world. Now, the Apostle Paul, writing in 1 Corinthians 5, he said this to the Corinthians. He said, I wrote you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of the world or the greedy or the swindlers or the idolaters. Since then, you would need to go out of the world. What I get from that is this, is that Paul is saying we need to associate with the sexually immoral, the swindlers, the greedy, and those people that are sinners, we need salt and light. That's what the purpose of salt and light is, to go into the world. <laughs> I, ha I have to control myself because, um, really, I would love once or twice in the evening to go to a bar. I just want so bad to go to a bar. Not because I drink. I don't drink. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
but I just want to go and sit at the bar and talk to people whose hearts are broken. If you want to find people who are searching, go to the bar and find the guy sitting by himself that's just getting drunk. He has nothing left. He has no friends or he'd be with his friends. And so it's all I can do. I, I figure Pastor Chuck might, might, might tell on me if I, if I went to a bar. So, so I'm, not, I'm not going, but I'm not kidding you. That, you know, when Cindy and I, our last three and a half years in Arabia, we lived in a, in a village. There were two of us. We were two Christians in the entire village. There were no other believers, no other Christians in the entire village. We knew that every day when we were out, every single person we saw, every single person we talked to, Needed Jesus. It's hard for me. I love, I love, I mean, I have to admit it's way easier to hang around believers all the time because they think like I do and they act like I do and it's just fun. I can relax. That's not what I want to do. <laughs> That's not where I'm at. I want to go where the lost people are. I want to I want to be with them. Well, okay, I'm, I'm going on too long. Second thing is, what, this is what gives me hope, is that even though people in the world believe like they do, this is important, listen, they're still people. And they may hide it, they may tamp it down, but every person inside has that need for God. They have a need for transcendence. They, if they really believed what they think they believe about science, you know, if you really believe that, then there's no purpose to your life. There can never be a purpose to your life because you are just an accident. And your death, that's the other thing, it's because they're there. They fear death. Your death means nothing. <laughs> but people in the world are terrified of death. They shouldn't be. If they really believed what they say they believe, they wouldn't care about death because their life doesn't matter either. Nothing that they do, nothing that they live, there is no meaning to life as nothing. But they do care. They know that their life is worth something. They know that their death means something, and they're terrified of death. And friends, we need to understand that. We need to... I don't want to say use that, but you, you don't understand what I'm saying. We can put that in our arsenal to help us lead people to Jesus and help us share Jesus with people. The third thing that I think of that I, as I approach ministry and society is that we need to teach like Jesus taught on the Sermon on the Mount. So how did Jesus teach? He said, you'll see many times, he says, you have heard that it was said this. And he says, but I say to you that. That's how we need to approach ministry outside the church today. We need to say to you, you've, here's what you've heard. And so we, in order to do that, we have to know what they're hearing. We have to know what they're saying. We have to be able to relate them. You have heard this, <laughs> but I say to you, this is the truth. And let the Spirit of God bring them in the way that they need to the way that the Spirit needs to deal with them. Now, the fourth thing, and this is important for me as a pastor, I need to train my, the folks in my church, I want to say my people, but that sounds kind of weird. I want to train the, the folks in my church how to live in a secular society. I want to train my folks what it looks like to work in an office as a believer among unbelievers. I want to teach them and help them understand how can you be a Christian truck driver in today's world? How can you be a secretary as a Christian in today? How do you relate to society? And so we've got some, I've got some ser sermon series coming up, I don't know when, <laughs> but about working and about living and about being part of society and working and, and how do we as believers interact with the world? And how do we as believers become a good neighbor to our neighbors? What does it look like to be a Christian neighbor? How can we teach our people how to do that? That's what I'm working on. So if you have ideas, I would love, I would love to know that. 
And the fifth thing that I think of is that we have to always share the bad news before we share the good news. One of the problems with evangelism is that we really want to get to the good news as soon as we can. But people do not appreciate the good news until they know the bad news. And so we have to convince them of the bad news first before they'll even be ready to accept the good news. And so the bad news is you're trying to save yourself. Maybe you're doing it through alcohol. Maybe you're trying to do it through drugs. Maybe you're trying to do it through your family or your career or making enough money or having enough good times or sleeping with enough women or looking at pornography. Whatever that is, that is not going to save you. The good news is there is a Savior that will save you. There is a Savior that can save you and will save you. So how does this look? I just wrote down an example kind of. So the, the, modern, the modern guy out here that I'm talking to might say, well, I might ask him, so what is the meaning of life? What does life mean? And many people in the world today would answer, the meaning of life is to be free. I have to be free. I want to be free to do the things that I want to do. And I would say, oh, that's, that's a great idea. You know, the problem with that, here's the bad news. <laughs> the bad news is whatever you try to use to be free is going to enslave you. We as people always construct gods. We have to serve as people. We have to serve something. And so money becomes our way to become free. We become a servant to money. Money becomes our God. We want to be free by, I don't know, what, I, who knows, having really, really nice cars or something. I don't know. That becomes our God. We become slaves. The bad news is, is that you want to be free, but everything you use <laughs> To try to free yourself is going to enslave you. But here's the good news. I know people who right now are sitting in a jail cell. They're imprisoned. They're being starved. They're being beaten. They're being tortured. And at any moment, they may be murdered. They may be killed for their faith. And they are the most free people that I know. Their spirit is free. <laughs> if you want freedom, freedom is only found in surrendering yourself to the only God that is worthy to be worshipped. The only one that's worthy to be a savior. That's what we have to surrender to. So they have to give the bad news before we give the good news. So that's through. How do we share Jesus in our culture? Okay, so I was exactly right in my, in my prediction. I'm ready to go in the spirit. What do we do as pastors to keep our hearts pure and our, and our hearts in love with Jesus? And I knew that I would be out of time, and I am. So what I decided to do is not say anything here except just a couple of three things. I'm going to share with you five of my favorite authors and give you a quote or two from my favorite authors. And I, I'm not even going to preach about it. All right, I knew I'd be out of time at this point, so that's why. So here's my, here's my five, five of my favorite authors. The first one, oh, hey, W. Tozer is correct. This is not a direct quote, but what Tozer said is that every day, and this is what I'll just share with you, this is, this is what I'm trying to do. All of these quotes are things that I try to bring to my life every day, remind myself every day of these things. Every day I need to find a private spot all alone where my heart slows and the noises fade, and I get a private space with God. Number two, Paul David Tripp. I don't know if you know all these guys or not. Paul David Tripp, fabulous speaker, fabulous writer. He said this. He said, Jesus took your rejection so you can be rejected and not worry about it. This is what gives me confidence to talk to those guys across the street with beers and cigarettes in their hand, knowing that I'm a pastor and they're going to hate me because I'm a pastor. That's okay. They can reject me. <laughs> I can take it because Jesus already took it for me. <laughs> I don't have to worry about it. 
And here is the one that I remember when I come to meetings like this. Don't try to make yourself look better than you are. Be willing to be vulnerable and humble. This is hard for me. You know, I get among my colleagues, and to be honest, I mean, I want you to like me. I want you to think that, that I'm better than what I really am, you know. <laughs> I'm trying to, you know what I'm saying? And so I remind every time, I, I'm serious, today I repeated this to myself 50 times preparing for today. Just be vulnerable, be, be humble. And I say to this to myself every Sunday. I, I don't want to be the big guy that everybody, you know, nobody can approach because he's the great man of God. That's not who I want to be. All right, Paul David Tripp. Kyle Eidelman. Okay, we got, <laughs> we got a fan here. Okay. <laughs> great writer, great pastor. Admiration of Jesus is not devotion to Jesus. Knowledge of Jesus is not intimacy with Jesus, and good intentions do not make up for weak faith. You know, in our world, in our world today, good intentions are everything. You know, if you, if you mess up really bad, all you have to say is, well, I meant well. <laughs> and that's supposed to cover it all up, you know what I'm, what I'm saying? I don't think when we stand before the throne of God in the last day, I don't think our argument is going to be, well, Lord, I meant well. <laughs> I don't think that's going to cut it. Kyle Eidelman. Gene Edwards said this, praying to Jesus is not the same thing as fellowshipping with Jesus. You can be devoted to prayer and never actually fellowship with Jesus. And Leonard Ravenhill, this is the last one. You already heard a poem from Leonard Ravenhill. This is the one I'm struggling to put into my life. Yet ministers who do not spend two hours a day in prayer are not worth a dime a dozen. Degrees or no degrees. I read that before we went on the mission field. and I, This is 40 years ago I read this. And I, that has stuck in my mind ever since. And I've always said, if I ever pastor, this is what I'm going to do. Now, I have to say I'm a failure. <laughs> So Cindy and I, we've been in Live Dead. So part of Live Dead, it, Live Dead is you, you commit to tithing your time. So every day, two to two and a half hours, we spend in prayer and Bible reading. That's just like bottom line. That, that never changes. But what I'm trying to do is live by this and spend every day a second hour in prayer just praying for my message on Sunday morning that the anointing would be on me, that, that, that people would be there with receptive hearts to receive the Word of God. I'm trying to spend an hour every day just praying for Sunday services. And like I say, I'm a failure. I'm maybe 50%, maybe three or four days out of a week. I'm, I'm, I'm failing as much as I'm succeeding, but that's where I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> That's where I'm going. And the second thing Raven Hill said was this. Preachers who should be fishing for men are now too often fishing for compliments for men. <laughs> All right, let me close. I have one last illustration. The guy on the right is, okay, yeah, good. Uh, is it Steph Curry or Stephen Curry? Steph Curry, okay, I put it wrong in my notes. I don't follow basketball, so I don't know this guy. Steph Curry, and on the right is who? Tim Tebow. We have some sports fans in the room. So these guys on the surface are very much alike. They're both great athletes. They're both, they both are Christians, very outspoken Christians. They both tweet and put Bible verses on different things. They both have charities. They both do all kinds of things. They are very public in their faith. People in America love Steph Curry, and they hate Tim Tebow. So why? <laughs> How can that be? Well, I think part of the answer is that there's two different representations of what Christian is and what the Christianity is. And Steph Curry is uh, what I would say the happiness Christianity, and that's talking about God's blessings, God's success, talking about family, talking about love, talking about prayer, all true things, all Bible things 
but all about positive, happy things. I call this the, I don't know, I call it happiness Christianity. And the reason people hate Tim Tebow is because he talks about the cross Christianity. He talks about sin, righteousness, God's judgment, and our need for forgiveness. Happiness Christianity will attract followers. It will make our churches grow. If you want to be a mega church, then you have to preach the happiness gospel. <laughs> but if you want disciples, then we have to preach the cross Christianity. I don't know if you've noticed this, but nobody ever talks about disciples anymore. We talk about this many person began following Jesus or became believers. We talk about followers and believers. But why do we never talk about disciples anymore? Where are the disciples? We need to make disciples. That's right. We need to make disciples. And so it's no wonder in our, in our society in America today, our favorite verse is John 3.16. It's the word of God. It's truth. It's great. But it's about love, and it's about his only son. It's whoever believes will not perish, will have everlasting life. That's everybody's favorite verse, the verse that everybody in America know. But how many people's favorite verse is Luke 9.23, the words of Jesus, when he said, anyone who would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. That is, I believe, what we need to have in our lives. And so, to the Father, to the Father, reconciling the nations to the Father. Through Jesus the Son, bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ to a society that has left the moors of Christian faith. And lastly, in the spirit, how do we as ministers, how do we as pastors keep our lives right before God? Lord, we thank you. Lord, we're so humbled by your word. We're so humbled when we think about how much you've invested in our life, you've given to us, for us as pastors, for us as, as, as preachers to give out to our people, to be able to shepherd your people well. And, Lord, that's exactly what we want to do. That's exactly what we need and what we want, Lord. And so right now, we surrender our life to you again. We say, Lord, <laughs> make us a disciple that we can make disciples. Lord, I pray that we not take the easy, short way but we take the way that you've called us to. And Lord, I thank you. Just while your heads are bowed, let me just, I'm not going to ask for any kind of show of hands or anything. I just want to share one thing. My, I'm sure my church gets tired of hearing this, but I say this almost every Sunday at the close of every service. To hear truth from the Word of God and not put it into practice is the most damning thing for your soul. To hear truth and not practice it will damn your soul. That's why the Pharisees were the way they were. They learned truth, but they didn't put it in their lives. That's why the liberal theologians of today in our world, they learned truth, but they didn't put it into their lives. The most dangerous thing we can do is to hear truth from the Word of God and not act on it and not begin to put it in our lives. So I'm going to ask you, I'm no show of hands or anything, I'm just going to ask you if you would... I'm just going to take one minute and let you think about the things we've talked about tonight. What's the one thing that you want to put into your life and you want to start doing? I'll just pause for a moment and let the Holy Spirit speak to your heart. Father, I pray right now for my brothers and sisters in this room, and I thank you for the calling. I thank you for what your plans are for Western Illinois, Lord, through the men and women in this room. Oh, how exciting, Lord, how exciting it is to see people dedicated to you who have given their lives to you. 
that you have called to go out and reach the world around them, around us, Lord. And I just pray right now in Jesus' name that you would fulfill your calling in every one of our lives in this room. May we walk in what you have called us to do and and who you have called us to be. And Lord, we give everything we have, everything we are, everything we ever will be, everything we want, everything that we are, Lord, we give it to you for your honor and your glory. And we say, Lord, take us and use us for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. John, you're here. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Mike. You see why he's a hero of the faith? He's the real deal. Amen. Thank you for that strong, strong word. I'll be come back and hear, I'll, I'll preach it another time. <laughs> so I just read those statistics this just today. I was going through that. Yeah, I just came across some of these things, same things, for my message on Sunday. So cool. All right. Well, I know that we're, we're past our time and everything tonight, uh, and I just want to send you with a blessing, and that is that God has got great things in store for your life, for your ministry, for your churches for your families, for your marriage. It's found in His presence. I've just been overwhelmed with that, that, man, when I'm in the presence of God, all of everything that He is, is there. And if I walk away from that and miss that, I miss it. (laughs) So, man, I just I want to pray just a quick prayer of blessing over us, and then we'll be off. Father, tonight, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your servant that you have laid this on his heart to challenge us tonight. I believe that you have done that, and I pray let fruit come from the seed that has been planted in our lives tonight. And, Father, tonight, I pray for every single person here, and I pray for those a part of our section that aren't here, that, Father, as this area of central Illinois, that for years people have said when they prophesy that they've seen this darkness and this heaviness over our area. God, we are believing for good things because you're a good God. And that your blessing of your presence is what we desire. God, we're not asking for your blessings of of financial wealth. and We are asking for the blessing of your presence. Because in your presence there is life change. For us and for those we will minister to. In your presence, we will see people healed. We will see people delivered. We will see people ministered and lives changed in your presence. And so, Father, I pray, let your Holy Spirit anoint each one tonight that as we leave this place, that we would walk in the anointing of your Spirit And that we would know that whatever you have for us, whatever we step into, we are anointed in that moment to speak and share the love of Christ. And that you are going to use us in a mighty way. Father, let great revival come to our churches. Father, we pray for this church in Quincy tonight. God, I pray your blessing upon Pastor Todd and the staff here in this church. God, upon the worship team. Father, I pray that this Sunday when they come to gather in this place, Father, there would be a sweet spirit this Sunday and every Sunday as people enter to know that you are here and they will be in your presence and you are going to move in this place. Father, let your blessing rest upon this church and upon all of our churches. And we just give you all praise and glory for who you are because you are our great God and our soon coming King. We thank you.
In the mighty name of Jesus and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Man, I hope you've been encouraged tonight. I hope you've been recharged tonight. Todd has some more stuff for you to take home with you tonight, so don't go home empty-handed. If you want to take one of these pews, you take it. You want that movie camera, you take it. You just That light fixture, it's coming down in the name of Jesus.